everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Property Renovation Podcast. My name is Juliette, and in case you're wondering why you're hearing a different voice today, it's because I have the great pleasure of being your co-host alongside of James. And so today, I'm get to, I get to interview and introduce James. We all know that he's renovated hundreds of homes over the course of his career, and he's seen pretty much every possible scenario you can encounter while out renovating a home. And so, James, welcome to your own podcast. <laughs> welcome, uh, Julia. Thank you very much for um, that in little introduction there. That was <laughs> and so we know you're coming from this place of this um, incredible depth of experience, but since you've always been our host, we've never got to hear your story. And um, I'm just really curious. So how, how did you come into this industry and what, what was that aha moment where you thought to yourself, I love this, I want to pursue this, this is what I want to do. How long have you got? <laughs> okay, so yeah, I'll just kick off. Um, I started when I was 18 years old. And this will probably scare a few people, but I know, <laughs> I know that other people that started in the same industry, they just did exactly the same. Yeah. Um, and what that is, is just have a go at it. That's it. No study, just have a go at it. And I, I, I think it always stems back to choosing my career. And I went into working for someone and I had a five year career, but I didn't really enjoy it. And I knew that I always wanted to do something creative, make things. Mm, okay. And I think it was right back because I always remember my dad he used to do some tiling and, you know, brick laying and stuff like that. So when I was like five, I do, I do remember those, those days. And um, so one day, I mean, um, circumstances in my life made me not uh, work at the, uh, the other company anymore. And I was left in a position as to what to do. What's, what's the next thing I'm going to choose? So I did. I decided to go and give tiling a go. So... I just practiced, but I had to practice on people's homes. So the first thing I did was I said that I've been doing it for a few years and I know that that is a terrible fib, but it was the only way I was ever going to do it. Worst case scenario, I don't do a good job, I don't get paid, right? Right, but is, was there a kernel of truth behind it though? I mean, did you help out your dad as he did his jobs around the house or? Yeah, 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 but I mean, never, was never were was I in a position where I got paid to do the job? It wasn't understood. Possible. Understood. So although I did feel really bad, I know that that was the only way, maximum risk, and it paid off. So um, I did go into someone's house, and they did think that I was tiling for a few years, mm -hmm. and I did do. I took my time, but I'd done an amazing job. And nothing actually went wrong. So wow. That, exactly. So <laughs> then I was like, okay, I can do this again. And I've done it again. And I really liked it because the feeling of stepping back and going, I, I just made that. I just created that. Um, just gave me the reason to go on more. And I think I really enjoyed, you know, just being rewarded like that. Mm -hmm. by, by someone going, thank you very much. Here, you know, here's the money. Um, and then it just stemmed off. And I mean, fast forward a couple of years, and I'm now walking into people's houses doing bathrooms. Mm -hmm. And I always remember the first day when I never did a bathroom in my life. And I was like, I'm going to be touching things like water. And, you know, a lot can go wrong. Yeah. But I did, I, I always chose, I chose the basement. So not much can go wrong. I can't really get water down in anyone else's apartment. So I, I did minimize my risk. Um, so yeah, and again, I took my time and still then there was books around and I read and I watched videos and stuff like that, just knowing how to do it. And it worked out perfectly. And I've still got that picture today. Oh, wow. So, oh, that's so cool. Yeah. And I, I always remember that day when I look back and just think, yeah, that's how I started. So, um, and then I went into kitchens, but I'd done about a good four or five years myself 
with a few friends of mine and people that I was working with at the same time. Um, and, but then I very quickly realized uh, that I could, I was getting more requests than I could manage. Mm. And rather than try and stretch myself, I, I said, okay, let me try and manage a job and let someone else do it and I will come back and make sure that they've done a good job. So I'd done that for a few years and I ended up going from a team of five to 15 in a very short space of time. Um, and then uh, I, I, I moved up the ladder in terms of like skills and done, went, went from bathrooms and kitchens to full property renovations. Right. It was a big jump, but um, in my head, I was just thinking, what are the other skills? The other skills are the main decorating. I didn't do anything like roofing or excavating or anything like that, but it was more like the electrics and stuff like that. So I knew yeah. I had to get in the professionals, don't bother trying things like that yourself and yeah. think out. So yeah, and um, that was us. That was, that was me. That was St. James Design Interiors back then. Oh, wow. And uh, then I guess like, yeah, where I am now in 22 years, I've got a company in London. And um, that's formerly St. James Design Series, but it's now Akiba Projects, mm -hmm. uh, named after my daughter. And uh, it's doing very well. I can't complain. We've we're worked for some very amazing people, um, commercially and residential. Um, and I just more manage it now. So it's, uh, I, 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 I can't remember the last time I was on, actually I do. And that was when I'd done my own house. So ah, yes. My second house, and I've pretty much done everything in, in here. So wow, after um, after being in a managerial sort of position in your own company for a while, how did it feel to go back to the sort of you know down with your hands, sometimes on your knees, just working and getting dirty again? I Was love that? It. Yeah, I love it. I mean, there are obviously certain things that I wouldn't do anymore, just because um, I think that. Um, well, first, my knees would probably go. So if I started tiling a floor, for instance, I'm not going to last. So I'm not exactly the, the, the healthiest person in the world. Um, but, yeah, I, I think, like, there's certain things. I gave, you know, all my tools are gone. I would have to mm. restart again. But I think the, when I get a chance and get to do something, it's great. Yeah, that's, a, that's such a great story. I mean, besides, you know, belatedly apologizing maybe to those first couple of clients who you sort of, you know, had to, you know, stretch the truth a bit there. In the um, end, yeah, but in the end, I did tell in them. The end. Oh, you did? I did tell them. And what was their reaction? They were just shocked. They could, I mean, they, they were more, I mean, that lasted two seconds because they were more happy with what I've done than anything else. So, you know, I, I explained that I needed to have a chance mm -hmm. and that was it. I mean, it's... It is really incredible whenever you can provide someone with real value like that, that's not momentary, but that you know will last years. There is incredible satisfaction in knowing that you are a part of that. I think the main point to say here, though, is that there are definitely people out there that will probably think, I'll give this a go. But definitely. what you've got to do is think in your mind, um, you know, there is, yes, there are tiling courses. Yes, there are, you know, brick laying courses and stuff like that. But you are better off doing it on your own sometimes because you really mm. do learn a lot better than from a book. And Definitely. if you're ever going to do it, anyone listening that wants to kind of follow the same way that I went, um, I would say that you must be prepared that if something goes wrong, you don't walk away. You know, you, you really do face up to it and deal with the challenges. And if you need to call someone else in like a professional to finish mm -hmm. the job, then do that. Yeah, definitely. There is, there is some, and it's your reputation, your job behind it. It's you learn faster than yeah. ever because you're fully invested. Yeah. I agree. So um, with that sort of amazing experience of starting really from the very beginning, learning and then going all the way to handling huge projects. I've seen your portfolio, you've incredible projects, well done. And so, um, 
so you've, it's really nice because you've seen small projects, you've seen big projects, you've seen all different scales and types, but um, I think you'll probably agree with me that in every single project, one of the most stressful things for the homeowner is the budget. Absolutely. And so today you and I, I get to interview you and we're gonna talk about the budget at every single project stage. We wanna talk about what you can expect, what you want to avoid, and then how you can make the most of your budget. And so I was thinking about it and I was trying to just sort of lay out the ground of everyone knows that you know, money is stressful, but specifically let's think of like, why is the budget such a huge source of stress? I think one, it's a huge stress because it's a resource and like all resources, they're limited. And so whatever project you have in mind, you've probably been saving for a little bit of while. You've worked really hard for this money, and you're about to spend it and you just you really want to make sure that you spend it wisely and you get the most for your money and then the other thing is is that you're spending your money on essentially an unknown project because as you know as i know you never know what you're going to find once you open up a wall once you bring that excavator in, you start digging a new hole you just you don't know what you're going to find and so you have a defined budget and an undefined problem and then i think the last thing that sort of will help you wrap your mind around just the stress that you're feeling is the fact that every single renovation requires thousands of decisions and every single decision has a price and a number attached to it. And so homeowners are constantly sort of in this position where they feel like I think they have to juggle a million different plates and they don't want any of them to drop. They have all these different priorities. They want to be able to do everything right. But again, we have limited budgets, we're not made of money. And so sometimes you end up being in a position where unfortunately you may have to compromise something. And that's just always an emotionally hard decision because you know, you've been dreaming of this project for years and suddenly it's not what you necessarily wanted or you'll have to shift gears or compromise, come back to it later. So anyway, so we are here to try and make it a little less stressful. And so, a little review. I'm an architect. James is a builder coming from the building side. And so, as an architect, we certainly help clients budget and help hopefully help them set uh, realistic expectations. But a lot of clients will ask me, "Is like, well, how much is this going to cost? How much is this going to cost?" The thing is, is that as the architect, I'm not the one providing the bid. Yeah. And so, I have a hard. It's. I mean, it's pretty much impossible for me to tell you how expensive something is going to be because there's so many factors that I may not be aware of because like say in Chicago every single I forget if it's June or July one um, the labor calendar switches and then there's new labor rates for all the trades and that's obviously outside of my control so I don't know what the new labor rates are I don't know how busy builders are I don't know how expensive subs have gotten you know access to good subs so there's a million different things and so that's why we are asking all these money questions to James today. Okay. So I think the first question is, um, I just wanted to start at the very, very beginning. So you're a homeowner and let's just take the example of a kitchen. So okay. I want, I know I want to renovate my kitchen. Mm -hmm. And so I have a few ideas, but I, since I've never done this before, I don't really have friends who have done it, something similar or on a similar scale. How could I even begin to understand how much a project can cost? Well, before you even speak to anyone, there's the internet, right? And um, if you just type in Google, how much does a kitchen cost, you will be there forever because there are so many people that are telling you different prices and different scenarios and different equations and everything else. Um, and it, kitchens can range from anything from an Ikea kitchen of a couple of thousand pounds or you know mm -hmm. dollars and up to 50 70 thousand pounds you know from an italian or a german kitchen so um really actually just like going on the internet going onto pinterest and finding out what your style is first like how what, what do you want this to look like do you want it to look ultra modern mm -hmm. do you want it to look um more traditional with the shaker style kitchen do you want handles do you not want handles these all all of these things kind of add up and then you need to think about um the worktops now 
you can go and get cheap laminate worktops. That's good. And it might cost you less than a wooden worktop, solid wood, or a Corian or granite or something like that. But okay, so cheap in the, in, in the first instance, but if you're going to replace that in two and a half years time, then it's not really cheap in the end, you know, exactly the thing. And the com combination of actually changing that isn't just, I'll take the works off, off, that's it. You need to remove the tiles. You need to remove the backsplash. You need to remove the cooker, the appliances. Then you get that out. So by the time someone has charged you for the labor, for that, this, that, the removal cost and disposal, it does add up. And I don't think many people really go that far in thinking about that. So, um, so that's the first instance. And then I would be thinking, how far do I want to go in this kitchen renovation? So do I just want to change the units? Or do I just want to change the doors? Am I happy with the layout of the kitchen? Um, do I want to completely change the layout? Complete, or, you know, just all of the appliances and move the, the sink from this side to the other side of the wall, you know? And, um, am I going to be ripping up the floor as well? Am I going to be knocking down a bit of the wall to extend the kitchen? There's all of these considerations. So first, I think... There are definitely some like kitchen companies out there with calculators on their website and you can kind of add those units up and get a, get a, an approximate price of what it's going to cost, but that will just be for the kitchen itself. Right. Uh, if you need to be thinking about the labor and the installation costs, you'll be surprised what goes through a builder's mind because um, if you're 15 flights up, and the only way to get them that kitchen in up the stairs and no lift, it's going to cost you more. And if there is nowhere to store anything in the house, it's going to cost you more. So um, it's, it's all about trying to make it as, as simple as possible for the builder. The builder goes through how many complications and obstacles am I going to go through? And then the homeowner should be thinking, how, easy, how easier can I make it? Without, mm -hmm. don't even think about, I'm going to, I mean, there are homeowners that will say, I'm going to remove the kitchen myself, it's fine. You can come in and, and install the new one. That's great, I'm all for DIY, but there is, I think you need to just ask the builder first, how much would it cost to remove? Because your time is your time off work. So, right. if, so if, it, if you're a doctor and you're getting paid 500, 1,000 pounds a day and you take off a full day to remove the kitchen and the kitchen is only going to cost you 300 pounds to remove, then there was no point. You're already exactly. done. So those are the things. That's, that's how you, um, you should, those, those are the, the, the costs and the, you know, what you need to be thinking about. So there's probably no way for a homeowner who's never done this before, they have no real, um, they have no way of knowing on their own without actually talking to someone. I guess I'm thinking of how does someone know, okay, this is a reasonable amount or we should probably save for another year's, another few years. Mm -hmm. Seems like they need to go talk to a professional to really figure out, are we even in the ballpark with this? It's always tricky because there are, um, by the way, building companies slowly, slowly but surely are, are re, um, they're reluctant to go and out of their journey. If it's this, the house is around the corner, that's fine, but they're not, they're, you know, they're not going to get in their car and spend some time in traffic to go to someone's house to give a free quotation in the hope that they're going to get the job. Right. That's getting less and less now. And I think if you really want someone serious, someone that's been doing it for years, someone with some inspiration that can give you some, some mm -hmm. ideas, then look for a specialist kitchen fitter and get them to come around. And they are giving you the knowledge of years, decades. So give them something back. That's what I would say. You know, if you, if you think that you're going to always get a free quote, then those, those costs are going to be higher for sure. But if you're getting someone around and they know that they are investing their time and in, 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 in return, they're going to get a little something for it, maybe just their petrol money or something like that, 
um, then you're going to get a better, better answer, you know, um, and definitely get two or three of those. Definitely. Yeah. yeah so, we also always encourage getting multiple quotes. And I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense because even if you end up not hiring a specific professional, even if you end up not hiring any professional, yeah. they've spent their time to come to your property, to look at it, not think about things in general, but to look at your specific property and talk to you about your specific project. And like you said, they're coming from a place of experience, of years and years of experience, yeah. problem solving. And so no matter what, from that conversation alone, you will learn things, things that you would never have learned otherwise. And so that's real value and that's real time and money that in the end you will have saved. So I think, um, I do encourage people to not always go for the easy free option because that's not necessarily the best investment option for your home. I, and I agree with you and not many people would really like to hear that, but it's true. And I think um, in any other kind of industry, you would pay money for a good expert to, to, to give you a diagnosis or to give you the good advice exactly. because they've been studying for a long time or whatever. Um, another point to mention about that is that if, you're, if, you, if someone is coming around and they're not getting anything for it, just the, the, the small hope that they're gonna get the job, then they're more inclined to not just be going to your house, but they're gonna be going to another three or four that day, which means they've got to fit them all in and they're not going to give you the time. They're going to give you right. 20 minutes and they're going to rush and they're not going to really think about it. And, you know, so and right. then as fast as they come in, they want to get back out again. Exactly. So, and also, I, I do think also um, there is something to be said of the danger of getting low ball bids. Because yeah. when it's purely spec work like that and you are working off of the hope of like, all right, maybe one in 10 of these projects in reality will go. Yeah. And so you're putting the professional in a position where they have to, yeah, it's, it's all, it's a lot of time and it's a lot of spec work. And so you just, to get the job, you lowball it. And it's unfortunate and we're not saying it's right, but it's a, it's another way of getting business and it's another way of handling business. And you have to realize that one of the, we're not saying that everyone's going to do this, mm -hmm. but I think it's worth noting that it's a potential risk that what you're setting yourself up for is a low ball bid just so they can get in there. And then all of a sudden, all these extra costs that you not, didn't think of that weren't included in that addition in the core bid mm -hmm. is suddenly handed on your plates. Buy cheap, pay twice. Exactly. That's the thing. So after, um, after an owner does go out and get this, I know you have a lot of thoughts on the ballpark figure to begin with. There was an earlier podcast about that. Yeah. But um, after you get this ballpark figure and you're like, all right, let's really make a go of it. And it goes beyond the very sort of schematic stage of like, okay, yes, we're going to do this. Um, at least here in the US and some um, architecture firms that I've worked with, what we like to do at sort of towards the end of design development, which is when walls stop moving around that you pretty much know, instead of just saying it's like, oh, new kitchen, we're saying new kitchen, the sink is going to go pretty much right about here. We know the island is about yay big. You know, when all the big details have been worked out, mm -hmm. we like to go out for, um, we call it budgetary pricing. Okay. And so is that, I'm wondering, is that a practice in the UK? Yeah, no, it is. Um, I mean, I'm just wondering how we would word that differently. I'm just like, you, you're talking about like, the, like a purchase list where you're, you're giving choices or tell me if I'm wrong. Um, I guess, I mean, it's not, in the firms I've worked with, it's not so much an official like AIA, AIA you know, American Institute of Architects mm. um, thing that you go out in this contract at this point in time, we go out and we get budgetary pricing, but one practice is at that point to sort of lock in generally a very a much more accurate estimate of how much the overall project will cost. Mm -hmm. And then if your designer is billing um, a percentage of the project fee, okay. it's when you lock that price in. And then so after that, then the client feels safe because you're locked into that price. And then they know the architect isn't, you know, picking expensive things simply for the purpose of running up the bill and getting a larger Okay. You know, because you, because we want to, and, and I, I think it's good because I want to be billed 
on my expertise and the value that I bring, not because you chose a ex more expensive countertop than another. There's no real, I don't, I don't think I should necessarily get paid more for that. So that's, that's the way I like to run my projects. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering when at that point, it's not a full, really detailed bid, but like a very sort of solid bid to sort of really move forward yeah. in terms of design and everything. What, um, what do you need on, on the builder side in order to get an accurate budget pricing? Well, for us, it does, it means a lot with the materials, you know, okay. um, the complexity of certain materials, how they're going to be fixed on the wall or the floor or the ceiling, for instance. Um, and the cop, I mean, the cost of that item, because you are weighing up against risk. So therefore it's going to take more time to do something. Um, and you might not necessarily be able to use your existing tools. You might have to go and get an, a specialist tool to fit it, that kind of thing. Um, and we also need things like elevations, di you know, exact mm -hmm. dimensions and measurements of things. So like handing over technical files so that we can assess exactly how this is supposed to be fitted ahead of time um, really um, helps with the cost. Right. So when you say technical files, can you give a couple examples of what those files are? So if someone wanted to have um, an enclosed uh, shower valve, so all of the pipe work behind the wall, just the shower valve itself, then there will be a technical file to that online somewhere uh, mm -hmm. on, on where you're purchasing it, which it will then highlight the dimensions, the distance, the, you know, how, how much it has to be in the wall. Um, and then the type of, um, uh, uh, da, 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 lost my word. Um, it, it, the type of connections that need to go with yeah. that as well for the inlets and the outlets. So, um, if you, if you, if you don't have that and you just know that it's a shower valve that you're fitting, then you're going to get on site and then you're going to, you know, the plumber's going to get on site. He's going to have a look at that. And then he's going to say, right, okay, I know what I need. I'm going to go to the shop. Bye. And that's it. He's gone for, you know, a few hours going to get all the bits and pieces and it's costing you money. Exactly. So, um, and the job's still not done. So yeah, I mean, always technical files, more, the more information, the better. Yes. Um, and the exact positioning of where mm. things are going. I well. see. Another thing worth, worth mentioning, I feel like for um, listeners out there is the fact that one of at least in my experience, one of the most important technical files to get to decide early is fireplaces because yeah. they take up one, they take up a lot of room mm -hmm. and two, you will have more requirements probably with the fireplace than anything else. And rightly so, because it's a big safety hazard. There's a lot of um, requirements in terms of how close you can have wood framing to the unit. <clears throat> it's called, you know, it's the minimum distance of all combustible materials to the unit. That's what they call it. Mm -hmm. It will tell you how wide any um, like stone has to be around it before you can have wood. Mm -hmm. If you imagine a shelf above the fireplace, they will tell you exactly how high does that, have, that shelf have to be. Yeah. How deep can it be? Because there, and there's restrictions around all of that. And so if you're planning to add a fireplace you know, to your new breakfast room or living room or a see-through unit, that's one of the things that you should try and nail down much, much earlier rather than later because it will inform a lot of design decisions and it might take up way more room than you think. So I encourage everyone to get that file. Yeah, I think, um, but then someone's going to go, well, how do I know? How do I know where exactly I want it? You know, I can see the 2D files and pff, fine. As a position, it looks okay. You know, I can walk past it, I can walk around it, whatever. But I don't see it. So right. where we end up saying, get some 3D visualizations done. Mm -hmm. You know, get some high renders done because then you can really, really see what it's going to look like. Um, and you bet your bottom dollar, someone will end up changing their mind and say, hey, no, I don't like it. I don't want it there now. I want it somewhere else. Exactly. And also draw your furniture in too, because it ends up coming, you know, one foot, two feet into the room. 
and all of a sudden your couch is uncomfortably close to that <laughs> fireplace or you know you thought you'd have a comfortable distance to sort of walk between the furniture pass by it you may not have as much room as you think so I'm always, yeah i'm a fan of actually um, putting down tape exactly that's a great thing to do on site you really know and or, even if you like boxes because boxes do give gives the volume they just give volume there they give more of a feeling of that you know you've got to move around it so just empty boxes and put them in place definitely i think that's a great great idea even if then even if you just have a box and even if you just um draw out with tape where that little end table of your sofa is going to be and then how big the sofa it's like the more you can really recreate that in a low budget sort of just a very lo-fi sort of way yeah. the better you're going to feel about your decision and then that'll help your budget in the end because you'll make less dis less changes on the fly yeah and that makes everyone happy that scares yeah. the last out of buildings builders because um they're already thinking okay fine so far, this is great. This is going to be a good project. I'm going to be in, in here for three weeks and then I'm finished. You know, but then they start to worry because if, if the customer is constantly changing their mind, then it's, it can work out very expensive. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. It's always more expensive to add an item than if it was in the budget to begin with. So, yeah, you won. yeah. Like we said earlier, plan, plan, plan. <laughs> So it seems like in terms of budgetary pricing, it's really, it actually really seems like there's not a real middle ground between ballpark and like full bid, detailed bids for the final project. Is that an accurate you, representation of what you're saying? Yeah, I, um, I think so commercially, um, is, it, it's much, much different because you have to tender for projects and you have to be locked in. That's the whole right. thing. Um, but with, with the residential side of things, it, it's much, much better if you say at the beginning, it's going to cost you this, have a contingency of 10% because this is, this is what it could be worst case scenario. But again, you tell someone worst case scenario, it's going to cost you 20 more, 20,000 more. They're not even going to call you. This is what, this is how the builder would think about it. You know, they would be thinking you just want the highest amount you're not there for me you're not right. there to um look after me when really they are they are yeah they're just telling you realistically mm -hmm. on the other side would you prefer them going in and saying it's going to cost you twenty thousand less and then they're already in halfway through your project and then they tell you it's going to be twenty thousand more what are you going to do right so always there is a reason behind why people say it's going to cost you more it's true it's true yeah. I feel like it's better to talk about money sooner rather than later because realistic expectations are one of the key things to having a smooth running project and just, it makes everything run better. It makes the relationships between the client and the builder or the client and the architect and the architect and the builder, like that entire triangle of relationship. It always works better when there's realistic expectations from the outset. Yeah. And so, and I understand that a lot of that is on you and I, because we're the professionals in the industry. Yeah. But um, I do know that a lot of clients are very reluctant to talk about budget in the beginning. They just want to talk ideas and the abstract of it and they, and they hide the budget. And I, I can understand that because it's um, on one sense, it's a very personal thing because it's, it's how much money they've saved. And you're, I could see a lot of sort of social just i'm not no, sure anim animosity it's like right around it like yeah. you don't want to say i'm rich or you don't want to say i'm poor you don't want to you know you know there's we don't talk about those things in normal everyday life but when you say how much is this going to cost and do you have it you're so it's it is like asking them oh how much money do you make and how well off are you it's so i understand it can be a strange thing but you're really the only th person you're really doing a disservice to is yourself if you're not giving away the budget because then we don't know the type of project, the type of budget. Yeah. You don't, there's, we're, it's just giving us an another unknown to work with that we. Which is then a worry. Yeah, and it's a worry. So. It's a definite worry. Um, 
I was just gonna, I was just gonna say a joke actually. Like if anyone is listening and they they are rich, then great for you, good for you. Um, so I would say if you do want to save money, do tell some, do tell us your budget. But um, before we come round, take all of those expensive paintings off the wall and hide them. <laughs> Just so that we can, you know, just so that you're thrown off the scent, you know? Exactly. <laughs> but um, the thing is, like, if you don't say how much, ah, that's what I want to say. So if you are just, um, the, the, the way that you need to think, it's not just because you've saved up the money, right, that you can afford this. You might have already taken out a loan from the bank. Exactly. Remortgaged your house. So you don't have to be rich to, to have some a luxury. Um, you can quite easily get money from the bank to do this. And, and this is another thing. So it's, we, we do, as builders, we do know, you know, just because you want a beautiful extension, which is fully made out of glass, it probably doesn't mean you're rich. It just means okay. that you want a bit of luxury and you're going to be paying for that for the next 15 years. Um, so again, think about, cost because it might not just be the money you've saved but you might already be a burden to this beautiful project for 15 years so think about it from the beginning exactly and also i don't i don't want to encourage listeners out there to think that you know professionals only want to work with the very high end high budget people because that's not it really i know it may sound disgenuine but it's really not true because so many of the most interesting work out there is when budget is a real constraint and mm -hmm. you're forced to find really creative solutions. And then there are designers and there are professionals and we like working with those sorts of problems and we find them interesting. So don't feel like everyone is simply out there to get you to run up your numbers because it's not true. It's not true. I think um, a, if you ask any building, a builder um, what their ideal client is, they're not going to, they might say an expensive client, someone that's rich, right? Because they feel that that's the fastest approach to simplicity, to being, uh, you know, answering questions uh, very, very, making decisions very, very quickly. You know, this is how they think about it. Um, everyone wants a simple life, including us. So mm -hmm. the, the, our ideal worst client is someone that doesn't tell you the budget, holds back the money, doesn't pay you on time, um, you know, that takes ages to make uh, decisions, changes their mind constantly. The, that's the worst case, you know. So if you're thrown off that you're going to be like that, it might cost you. <laughs> it really might. It's from the design point of view. It's the you're. I'm sitting here nodding along. It's like yep, yep, yep. Like true. Like that's. It's not. I mean, it doesn't mean that like they're the worst client, but they're the hardest to. They're the hardest projects to work on because you're never quite sure what they want. And we just, and we, and we're here because we want to give you what you want. But when you're changing your mind all the time, it's like, mm. it's like sending a dish back to the kitchen. It's like, yeah. I want, I want it spicy. No, it's too spicy. It's, and I'm just like, I don't, if I just knew <laughs> what you wanted, I could go and make it. It doesn't become enjoyable anymore. This is the thing. So if, if, if you know, wow, from the beginning, you know, it's like, um, you meet someone for the first time and you go through the honeymoon. Right, and you just like, I'm really enjoying this project. This is going to be great. I can really see that in two weeks' time, closure, beautiful designs, and then that doesn't happen. And you find that you're working on the double the time. It doesn't. It's not about the money because you might be getting paid for it, but right. you lose um, passion for it. You know, yeah. because you do want to see the end result, and it's the right. same as a building company. If they think three weeks in here, it's going to look great. I can put it on my website. It's going to look fantastic. But if they're in there because they they have to step six steps back because of a change, yeah. it drives them crazy. Yeah. So once, twice, okay, but yeah. more than that. Exactly. And I think you mentioned um, earlier in the conversation Pinterest, and I do think it's worth really spending the time to understand what you want because – James can't do that for you. I can't do that for you. Only you know what you want and you know what's works best for you and your family and your particular property. So it's, um, we can try and help, but that really is, it's something that ultimately has to come from you. And so we would rather that you spend more time way up front early, you know, when things haven't really gotten going, when, you know, 
when it's not like, all right, we got this lead time. And so to get this done and by this, we need to get this done. So this has to be decided when you're not in that stage and you're sort of in more of the fleet fleet free flowing idea stage and brainstorming, that's when you really pull out the Pinterest and you figure out what exactly do I want? And don't just look at the pretty pictures. Mm. I mean, yes, look at the pretty pictures. That's what Pinterest is about. <laughs> but also look at, um, don't just look at color. Don't just look at the materials. Don't just look at the pretty plumbing or the light fixtures. Mm. Look at the scale of the space. I can't emphasize that enough mm. because that's, that's what will determine if that idea will or will not work in your space. Agreed. So you can find lots of inspiration images, but also find reference images, not just inspiration images. Mm -hmm. So anyway, back to money. <laughs> so when you are in sort of that final budget stage and you're about to you know, dispatch you know, the tradesmen out to the site, what, what are the biggest what are the things that affect the price the most? Are there even like, is there even a list of say the top five or top 10 things that sort of affect the budget the most? I, I mean, if you're there, there is always the unforeseen. And, um, but I think that can honestly just come, um, that can only go so far because Every, any builder that's been in the industry for more than 10 years, five, 10 years, they should really know what those kind of unforeseen are going to be. And, you know, really, right. you know, have that discussion with the client Just say, if we do open up this wall and, you know, this happens then. So it's always good to, to have those five things that really play a part on the budget. I think, um, if you're adding any any electrical appliances that require a lot of um, a load of electric, mm -hmm. then you might have to have a complete new consumer unit. If you're changing your kitchen from one side of the house to the other, and it has you know your kitchen has the boiler in there because that's usually where they are sometimes in in the UK, mm -hmm. um, then then that might you know, you might have to move that entirely to a different location in the house. And right. that's quite expensive. Um, I think uh, another part would, would be certain types of legislation that you have to abide by. Mm -hmm. um, and certain boroughs, certain councils, they can be quite, a, you know, quite difficult so that will really play a part as well. Um, and then I think um, if you're in a communal property, how much you have to protect and notify um, yeah. and assess the risk as well in terms of that. So those are the kind of things that would yeah. play a part. Yeah. Definitely. And I would even say, especially because, um, I mean, because I live in a city and I live in an urban environment and I know London where you're, um, home offices is a uh, very urban environment. So one of the bigger things that we come across is um, every single building will have, will set its own building hours. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, sometimes you think you can work from, you know, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. or, you know, sometimes you really can't. And that means the number of days that the guys have to be on site or women, I don't want to stereotype, you know, is it'll be, the project will take longer. They'll have to clean up all the common areas every single day. They'll have to re-tape down all the protective surfaces every single day, and that's more time. And so, like you said, there's a whole, there's a whole level of planning and detail and stuff that has to do with your project, even though it's not necessarily your home. Yeah. So just be aware that when you're getting these prices and they seem kind of high, there may just, just inquire because there may be a whole level of work that you're not thinking about that has to happen, you know, but that's why we're here. Yeah. I remember projects um, that we used to work on in the city and the times were um, nine till two. Wow. Oh my gosh. And then nothing between two and four. And okay. then from four to six, you can work. And then only nine to one on a Saturday. So you have to have 
two hours break in the middle of the day every day wow that's i've never heard of that that's yeah extraordinary yeah westminster <laughs> What was happening between those hours? Is it was it for the late was it for labor to enforce labor laws, or is it I, um, important to have quiet during it, it, kids it, commuting, it was, coming home? Yeah, it was a com like a it was twenty five flats in a mansion, okay. and you just that that was the rules. That was the rules. There was nothing you could do about it. Right, just got to follow the rules. <laughs> All right. So in terms of. Um, I'm interested in explaining and kind of understanding more from your side the way you structure a bed. So say, again, let's stick with the kitchen example. We know exactly where everything's going to be. Yeah. We know exactly what materials we want everywhere. Mm -hmm. So when we get a bed, what, how can we expect that to be laid out and structure the different categories? And what, um, how would you sort of explain the best way of understanding that entire framework of pricing and bidding to someone who's never done it before? <laughs> Usually things like painting, decorating, plastering, those kind of things are measured in the UK by the day. So how long, you know, how a, a day's wages would cost right. for that. Um, but I know that in European countries, it's measured by the square meterage. I don't know how it's done uh, in the US. Uh, painting and stuff a lot of times per square foot. Per square foot, there you go. So it's, it's actual accurate measurements, mm -hmm. is the thing. And I, I think that's the biggest problem um, in the UK. They, they made a big mistake with that because um, you're, you, there is really, there, there are plasterers out there that can be very quick and there are plasterers out there that are very, very slow. Uh, but if there was an equal price across the board, I think mm -hmm. that that would balance things up, oh, I see. but it doesn't not at the moment. So um, I think uh, you will have to ask your question again. <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm more, I'm more interested because um, I've received, you know, I've looked at a whole number of bids over the years and sometimes the categories for are easy for me to understand because yeah. I'm in the industry, mm -hmm. but sometimes they're, not easy for say a homeowner like one category i commonly hear homeowners being like what is what is that do i even need that it'll be like the thermo and plastics category and they're like i'm not i'm not putting plastic in my home like what are you talking about I'm like no like that number is the insulation and you really need that in your house <laughs> or, or they'll come across a number for the other really big one that i want to talk about is allowances it's like you get x allowance for cabinet hardware Ah, okay. so, homeowner is like, ah, uh, is that good? Is that bad? Or a lot like flooring. Yeah. Because flooring varies a lot in price. So yeah. Um, actually, yeah, let's just talk about allowances and how, how are they used? And are there sort of, is there a way that a homeowner can look at it and allow them to be like, okay, that's reasonable. Or they can sort of see, is that maybe where the builder is putting that in an allowance for that when maybe it should be a hard bid? Like how, how is how are allowances used? Allowances are used really to do with electrics. So how many light switches, how many spare switches, how many um, lighting points, those kind of things. And if someone says that they, they're not sure, they want five, maybe 10. So you put an allowance in and those are, then if there is any more additional points, it's charged by the point on top of that. It's more of um, a protection uh, for both the homeowner and the builder because then they know that that's the limit to go to for the allowance, you know? Okay. Yeah. That's I mean, actually interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, so with an itemized quote, um, it's kind of like you're giving over all of your tricks and all of your information. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think you'll truly find, I might be wrong, but I, I think that in the UK, um, you will find someone that would write a very bland quotation and they'll probably put removal, disposal, first fix electric, second fix electrics, and that's it. But they won't go really into, you know, fine details, you know, um, because it takes time. And it um, so, so I, I, that's usually how a quotation is done um, okay. by just 
um, what you need to be looking for is the category. You need to be looking for the quantity. You need to be looking for a bit of description in terms of a method statement, how that is going to be put in. You need to be looking for the cost per item and then the total cost. Make sure that you understand if that is inclusive or exclusive of VAT as well. Because I think a big mistake people make sometimes. Yes, definitely. And I think also what's interesting is that in the US, at least just for in my experience, and granted my experience is limited in the sense I've only worked in Chicago mainly on these residential homes. We, there were some homes in other states and stuff, but most of it was, you know, I've found as I've started working in other regions, I've found a surprising number of things are regional. And so, you know, listeners, if you ever hear anything different and would like to educate us, please let us know. Yeah. But um, it is interesting that lighting and those things you're saying are what's commonly found in allowances for you. And for us, a lot of times it would be flooring, um, sometimes countertops, depending you know, on the stone they build. Yeah. Hardware is a big one, both for doors and for cabinets. Mm -hmm. Plumbing fixtures is a big one because like, just like lighting, it can be very affordable. Go to Home Depot, go to whatever corner, like hardware store, and get it. Or go to the showroom and pay something extravagant for something incredibly luxurious. It's the same with like um, tiles because fitting a ceramic tile is a lot cheaper than fitting a um, mosaic sheet exactly. of tiles that are made out of stone. Probably one of the worst, <laughs> you know, or glass, you know, that's a- uh, Glass, you know. yes. So Definitely. it really does differ in price and they're, they're done by the square meter edge. Yeah. And so when you, if you do solicit a number of bids for your project, what you will probably find out is every builder has their own system that they've sort of developed over years to estimate these jobs and that's how they put together their quotes. And so, well, first of all, I guess I'd like to say don't expect the quote immediately because you may think you're going to the contractor, he knows all the numbers, he can put together the quote, I'll have it, bing bang. Yeah. No, because what the, what the general contractor has to do is like they are the general contractor and under the general contractor, they're all the subcontractors. And so the general contractor usually goes to his subs and the subs then give him an estimate and then he has to compile that. And so it's actually a much more involved process, especially if the contractor chooses to get a couple quotes from a few different subs. Yeah. And then just the way, the same way that subs have, same way that the general contractors will present their quote to you in sort of different categories, the contractor you know, he's not just doing that for three overall build, bids the way a homeowner does. The contractor has to then put together different bids from different contractors for every single trade. And so the amount of work behind that really is enormous. And so this is, again, kind of why we're talking about it's like, oh, how much is this going to cost? One, that's not really a cut and dry question. Yeah. And two, there is real work and real time involved. And it's not a quick estimate that we can do off the back of a napkin. No. So. But anyway, so, but when you do get, you know, after that whole process is done and when you do get to sit down with say three complete bids, you will probably notice different categories. I and want so, to say one thing first. Yes, go ahead. Very important. And this is really understand the companies that you're calling to come in to do the quote, because you can get a separate electrician, a separate plumber, yes. all mm -hmm. independent. And you might think you're going to save yourself money. Right but it doesn't work like that <laughs> because they are going to be complete strangers. Imagine this. You, so you're calling everyone in who don't know each other and then you're expecting them to communicate with each right. other. And that's, that doesn't work. So it's much better to think about hiring a company that has got everyone under one roof that have been working together. They know exactly how they work together. They know the speed of their, each other's work. That is the best way. To, you know, to get a couple of quotations. Just one company come in that has everyone underneath them. Absolutely. I completely agree because a home is an exercise in coordination of many, many different trades. And the better that is coordinated, the tighter your house will be and the happier you will be living inside of it. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so but um, what I was going to say is that it is worth really taking those bids 
that you get in the end if you, if you are getting competing bids and not just looking at the bottom line mm. um, because you can't necessarily say, oh, lowest, highest. Granted, that's something that you should take note of and you will inevitably. I don't have to tell you to do that. But do look at the different categories because you'll know what questions you should ask when you really see which categories vary widely in price. That's when you should be like, all right, maybe we're not giving them enough information. Yeah. Maybe like may, a lot of times what will happen is that two will be very close together mm-hmm. and then a third will be just off, low, high, whatever. It'll just be sort of off the charts. And then you can call and ask, um, depending on, as an architect, a lot of times, you know, we can call the general contract and be like, just ask them why their bid is that way and ask them like, did you need more information to me? You were coming in maybe a little high, a little low, just want to make sure you'd want to re- revisit that number. And other times you may find that um, when you're trying to compare apples to apples, it's, it, it doesn't compare that easily across all the categories. And so it is a bit of time to sort of understand this guy has X number for millwork, custom millwork in your home. Yeah. Another might put that in an allowance, but that allowance may or may not find its way into that total number at the bottom. A lot of times that bottom number may or may not include the allowances because they just don't know how you're going to price. And so what you did think was the lowest bid may actually be high because of the way they're accounting or the way they're counting, they're adding it all up. You could, al- you could also um, put, it, put the shoe on the other foot and just ask them, um, I, can, I can see that you've come in at this price for this bit of work. Can you explain how you're going to do it? And what material are you going to use? Because then you can compare that to the other two or three, whatever. Definitely. Um, And the other point is, is that if someone has come in a little bit low, maybe for some carpentry work, okay? So let's explain like the stairs, maybe the new stairs is going to come in. And you're looking at all three of the quotes and you think, this one is really, really low. It's like much lower than the other two. There might be a very good reason behind that. He might actually have a workshop with a load right. of wood exactly. that he's managed to buy, he or she's managed to buy, um, you know, in bulk and mm-hmm. can afford to give it for a, a lesser price. So it's really good to just ask those questions. Don't, I think the key, what we're trying to say is don't be afraid to ask. Exactly. Like, always ask those questions. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And in some ways, just, it's almost, um, I don't want to be too cavalier about it, but it's, it's almost not worth being shy about these things because you will spend the money. They will find out your budget. They will literally be in your home and all the private spaces. And so it's, it's not worth being shy. It's everyone's, it's, you're going to be an open book at one point because your home's going to be open to everyone. Yeah. And so just, um, just set the tone right from the beginning and just be transparent and open and communicative. I always prefer being over communicative. I don't know anyone in this industry who prefers over communication. Like over communication is a welcome, welcome thing. Absolutely. Like I don't mind if you tell me five times because then I won't forget. Yeah. And then, then we're going to get along great because you're going to be happy with what I'm doing. I know exactly what I should be doing yeah. and everyone will get along. Yeah. 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 And the, a bit about just to touch on the communication, always let everyone know when they can communicate with you. If you're going to be in meetings, great. You know, if you can, if you're contactable on the weekend, when you can, when they can come around and see you and go through things, because all of that talking and coming up with, you know, ways of how this is going to work and, and, and visioning what's going to be happening the week after mm-hmm. it's the best thing ever. So, Definitely. Yeah. And so we've been talking about this um, stage of the project, I guess for a while, once you're like really in construction. Mm-hmm. So um, sort of to start wrap things up, what are some things that homeowners can do sort of in the process of, you know, things are, actively under construction, what can they do to really help control costs and not, you know, so the project doesn't suddenly become this runaway horse of, of, a, of your budget to sort of ballooning and feel, feel like you're, you're out of control. Read the contract, just read the contract and the mm. conditions number one, because in that contract, you should always have an agreement that the building company will not go and do any work unless you are happy with knowing the costs, and knowing how long it's going to take to do. Simple as that. If 
a builder, I mean, in the UK, the way that it stands is that um, if a building company does work and they haven't got any evidence in talking to you and sharing the price with you, then good luck to them because they will not be entitled to your money. Mm. You have to give it because you didn't agree with that. So yeah. that's number one. Um, number two, get out of the way. Just get out of the way. Number, you know, come, come, in, come in the evening when work is done and we can talk about things and whatever, but be very clear in the morning before you leave for work. Have a, a specific agenda to talk about and what you need to achieve for that day and an understanding of what, what's to be expected. Then yeah. just get out of the way. Let them do the job. Because if you're standing behind them watching them every single day, then that, they're not going to enjoy that and it's going to take longer. So I would say those two things. Yeah, and then to go along with that second point is I always really try to encourage clients to not live through their home renovation. Even if you can, even if you're like, oh, but it's out of the way. It, it is out of the way, but it's really not because, um, because it becomes a job site and not a home. And then for, for, for the tradesmen to work optimally at optimal speed where they're comfortable and they can sort of treat it as a job site and not worry about, oh, there's a nail, there's a kid running around. There's just... Hats. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, you never know. So I always encourage it. It will be faster and easier and simpler if you can find any solution, live with your in-laws, friends, neighbors, Airbnb for, you know, a few weeks. If you can find an alternative place to stay, it's always a huge, huge help. It's, it's, it's a tough one because that does have to play part of your budget and Definitely. not everyone has got the spare cash line around to leave their house. So I think um, definitely like if you're not able to stay anywhere, um, then you should really like, let's just say a kid, you know, family with kids, right? Mm -hmm. So at the very least, maybe the kids can go and stay with the grandparents. Maybe they can stay with a friend that's got kids, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then you guys, um, mother and father, they, you, you, you can just go away for the day. Maybe, you know, you can go for a long drive, a little small weekend away, something like that, where the main work can happen. And I think that's a good thing too. Ask the building company when and how long are the most deconstructive work going to take? Definitely. Because you're not going to be, a, your emotions will just go up and down, up and down. Because your house, you're, you're going to see it at its worst with everything stripped out. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get worried. You're going mm -hmm. to get nervous. And the inevitable happens sometimes, you know. It's a construction site. There are going to be the odd, you know, someone might knock a pipe and then there's water spraying everywhere. If you're at home and you, you're, you're hearing that, a builder knows I can deal with that straight away. I right. can shut it off. But the homeowner's thinking, my, it's my home, you're ruining my home, you know, and you're just going to be so angry and annoyed and then the builder's going to be nervous and then it's just not a good place to be. Yep. I agree. It's... It is tricky, but I guess what I'm saying is that you may save money in the end by staying in your place because, of course, finding an alternate residence is very expensive, but it's not, it's not an automatic savings because there, there's still a cost associated yeah. with you staying in your home because yeah. the work will proceed differently. That's the only thing I would want to point out. Don't think that, oh, we're going to save X because you will end up spending that within the budget because it will take more time. Yeah. Yeah. Or are there any sort of like final um, points that you can give us about how to um, like things to do and then things to avoid generally? I think just it's, it's all around communication. If, if that, if you on your, your, your game with communication and the builder loves you because you're, you are communicating well, you're being, you're giving clear instruction, um, then it's you're going to enjoy it. And I think definitely another idea is record the moment, record pictures from the beginning to the end for two, two reasons, memories. Mm -hmm. And, um, you're going to want to know where pipes are. Mm -hmm. where, definitely. That's another thing, because if you start like two years later, wanting to knock a hole through the wall to 
put something to support something like um i don't know uh what are they called in the sleep in uh they hang them on hammock yeah hammock? Like hammock or something like that you want to know if it's going to be you know if you've got some support there or something like that so definitely um what else um just have a schedule and a clear understanding as to what is going to be done at what times expect overruns mm -hmm. as well and be very very clear from from the beginning what um if if, if you're not going to be a um reachable during the day um during the deconstructive stage or the first installation stage then have a conversation with your builder and say it's okay to do the extra work if the budget is, you know if the cost is under 200 dollars or you know 180 pounds or whatever but anything over that you can't do it talk to me that's that a waste yeah yeah because then you don't get carried away yes definitely and also even even on a more basic like very basic just from the outset it's always good to distinguish um, within both the building company and within you know the homeowners who the two principal points of contact are because that way you're not running in five different directions trying to get a decision like we need to know who the key stakeholders are and who the decision makers are even if of course you're going to go back and talk to your team mm -hmm. but um, it just the stream of communication is then much easier to document and follow and it's it becomes easier to manage the whole project yeah. when people know who to expect information from and even when to be, be able to expect that information. Mm -hmm. And fo follow up a conversation. If you have a conversation on, on the phone or a verbal conversation in a meeting, follow it up with an email, you know, or exactly. something. Just so it's documented, you know what was said and what was, exactly. what was done. Yeah. yeah, email. I mean, I know email, a lot of us, you know, that. Inbox zero is sort of a myth, like you get, you get inundated with a ton of emails, but I love those emails from clients because then, then it's in writing and then, like you said, everyone can then get along <laughs> because we all know what, they know what I need and I know what they need and it's just, it works out so much better. Yeah. Right. And one more, actually, don't be afraid to pause and just say, right, give me a second. You know, it's going too fast. Give me a minute you know, overnight, 24 hours, just so that I can adjust and because I might come to you with a few other suggestions, but don't just like full steam ahead. A building company likes to go in with a clear instruction and get out very quickly. They don't like being in people's homes. Yeah. You know? But, um, and therefore they will go very fast. Right. If, if they can. So always okay. slow them down if they're going too fast. Definitely. Yeah. Like we said, like we keep saying, at least I hope we keep saying, like it is your home, it is your project, you know, and you can take charge of it and control it and manage it, so. And if you can't, get a project manager. Exactly. <laughs> get someone else who can be, you know, your voice, your advocate on site. That's one yeah. of the best things you can do, definitely. Yeah. All right, James, well, this was such a good conversation. I feel like I learned a ton from you, even though I am in the industry. It's so good hearing it straight from your side of the table. Um, I think we've learned a lot about what to expect and things to do, like clear communication, mm -hmm. planning, scheduling, getting the technical specifications as soon as we can, yeah. um, different things we can do on site to help us make decisions, you know, getting that Pinterest ready, you mm -hmm. know, blocking things out on site, which can be so valuable. Yeah. And then um, things to avoid, like making changes on the fly, being indecisive. So much, so much good information. Thank you. No problem. No problem. If we if we can work out anything that we can put in a document, and then we can put it on the blog, maybe we can bullet point a few things to help out the listeners as well. Maybe. Definitely. And if you, of course, if you have any, if this sparked any questions for any listeners, just leave it in a comment, and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Amazing. All cool. right. Thank, Thank you. you so much, James.